So hello everyone. So welcome to our this week Rutgers Infusion AI seminar. And today we're very glad to have Professor Zhu Zhang from the Cornell University to give us this talk. And Professor Zhang is currently Associate Professor in the School of EC at Cornell University. His current research investigates new algorithms, design methodologies, and the automation tools for heterogeneous computing. His research has been recognized with the Facebook Research Award, Google Faculty Research Award, the DAC Under 40 Innovators Award, the Rising Professional Achievement Award from the UCLA School of Engineering and Applied Science, Adopt a Young Faculty Award, the IEEE CEDA Early Career Award, and the NSF Career Award, and also the Rose Freeman Award for Technical Innovation from Zynix, and the multiple best paper awards and the nominations. And the, prior to joining Cornell, Professor Zhang was the co-founder of the Auto ESL, a high-level since I stopped, later acquired by the Zynix. So now let's welcome Professor Zhang to give this talk. Thank you, Bo. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's great to participate in this uh, fantastic uh, seminar series. Uh, today, I wanna share some of our recent results, research results on dynamic uh, optimizations for efficient deep learning. Um, the overarching goal, hopefully it's moving on the screen. Right, the overarching goal here is to enable you know, this efficient machine learning, especially the deep learning, right, at the edge. Because uh, clearly there are actually a lot of applications, right? There's a lot of demand uh, for more efficient ML, right, on this, uh, you know, embedded and also mobile devices. Right? There are, you know, a lot of use cases, right? you know, smartphones, right? or maybe smarter phones, right? autonomous systems, and touch IoT devices. These are fairly well known, right? I'm not gonna harp on it. Um, but there are also many constraints, right, that we're facing. They are very limited resource constraints, right? The compute resources are very scarce, right, in many uh, embedded devices, uh, not just the compute and also the, the memory resources. And also we, in many cases we have to deal with the real-time constraint when we're dealing with a very tight latency budget and uh, some privacy concerns as well. Um, now, if you look at, uh, for example, ResNet 18, which is not considered fairly small, right? Uh, Alyssa, uh, not one of the, the larger networks, but even mapping this kind of network to an embedded FPGA, like this uh, Science R296 V2, which is something that I'm going to get back to later on. So this is this mapping, right? This implementation is actually non-trivial. Okay. Uh, for this reason, we are actually seeing that, you know, there are uh, a lot of research efforts, right? So which focus on specializing uh, the, the deep learning models and also the, the hard work starters. Right, so to achieve higher performance, also higher energy efficiency. Uh, in uh, my research group, we are actually looking at this, uh, we are taking this a co-designed approach where we are trying to build you know, new hardware starters that are not just uh, designed for existing or off-the-shelf neural network models. Okay? At the same time, we are also looking at uh, how to customize, how to optimize the uh, deep learning algorithms so that they can run more efficiently on some of the emerging hardware starters, not necessarily just a commercial or commodity hardware like CPUs or GPUs. Um, actually, in the past few years, uh, we have been looking at uh, a wide range of topics, right? trying to look at how to compress or optimize the, the deep neural nets or DNA models in different ways. You know, these are some of the fairly well-known right, topics or techniques, right? for example, uh, quantization, um, Sparse, right? How to do sparse pruning and how to use the, the structure weight matrices. Okay, uh, you know, we have uh, papers in both uh, uh, the ML menus, also the, the computer hardware menus. Okay, today uh, I actually want to focus more on this so called dynamic pruning. Okay, so this is where we optimize the, the neural network at uh, inference time. So I'm going to talk more, focus more on the inference time today. Some of the techniques also apply to the training time optimization. And specifically, uh, I want to focus more on the so-called fine-grained dynamic pruning. I'm going to start with this uh, technique called channel gating. Um, and later on, I'll move on to uh, quantization. Okay, you can actually view this chart as sort of a, a torus. Okay, you'll soon find out that you know, although you know, uh, this technique are listed far apart in my chart, uh, they are actually closely connected. Because in both cases, we are doing dynamic quantization or dynamic pruning. Okay. All right, so let me start with channel gating. Uh, this is 
which I work uh, with the Cornell student, uh, Will Oweja, Yuan, and also my Chris uh, Dasa and Essa. Uh, we have a paper in uh, New York two years ago, and also we have a paper in micro uh, on the hover implementation of this technique. So this is where we are trying to exploit this so-called dynamic sparsity. Uh, so first of all, what exactly do I mean by dynamic pruning? Right? So that's where we have to define static pruning first. There are uh, many well-known techniques right, to prune a network. For example, uh, you know, this is a, a very well-known right, deep compression where we prune away these individual weights or activations in a somewhat unstructured or irregular way. Right? This often make the model you know, quite unstructured in terms of both storage and also compute. Uh, which in many cases makes things hard to, to paralyze. Right? And uh, there's a more structured way to do pruning, which is called group convolution, or some people call it grouped convolution. Uh, in this example, you know, we have uh, we basically partition the input channels and output channels into two groups. Right? We have the, the blue group and green group. Okay? Uh, with group convolution, basically the, the convolution will only happen, only occur right, for the for inside the group. Uh, this is how we can quickly prune away you know, half of the, the compute and also the filters. Uh, actually, if you look at mobile net, right, this is a fairly well-known um, com compact neural net model. It's actually using some, something called depth-wise convolution, which is basically an extreme case of group convolution. But there's a downside of convolution because in many cases, right, since we are doing this grouping, uh, we are losing the sort of information exchange across channels. So that's where uh, we often see a non trivial loss in accuracy. Um, there are some uh, mitigation. For example, we can try to shuffle right, the, the groups right, before we connect to the, the next layer. This technique is used in these uh, well-known architectural shuffle net. Uh, this actually helps a lot in terms of facilitating the information exchange or information flow across different groups. And this can help uh, to regain some accuracy. But still, in general, um, you may lose some accuracy with this sort of a cross grain structure uh, compression. And also, the other thing I want to point out is that you look at all these techniques, right? Whether we are doing this sort of a unstructured or more fine grain pruning or more structured group convolution. So, we are doing this uh, at, uh, you know, before the inference time, right? Basically, at the inference time, um, the, the prune model. We'll, regardless of the, the, the kind of input image that we are dealing with, that we are processing, the inference time, right, the time that we do the inference, uh, it's going to remain the same. It's going to be re it's going to remain a constant, right, regardless of the, the input, whether we are dealing with some sort of easy images or more difficult images, right, whether this uh, model is prone or not. So that's what we call the static pruning. Okay, so basically, this pruning happens before the, the inference time. Um, but this is probably not you know, similar, but it's not how our you know, human visual system works. But you will consider uh, our, right? So the way we perceive things, okay? That is, you know, for me, uh, when I look at the image, uh, in some cases, I can immediately tell what's going on, right? What are the key objects, right? In a split second, right, right away. But in some other cases, I may have to stare at the image uh, for a few more seconds, right? To figure out what's going on. Uh, the research question that we are asking here in this project is that can we enable a similar right, kind of a you know, uh, phenomenon? Right? Can we sort of dynamically optimize? Can we dynamically reduce the compute effort of our deep neural network uh, when we are looking at images right, with diff of different kinds? So that's the research question that we're asking. And the key idea that we are taking is that we will try to reduce the, the compute effort for some unimportant regions of the, the input features. And uh, by region here, actually we're doing this in a very fine granular way. So we're actually basically looking at a, a pixel level granularity. Okay, so let me be more, more clear, right? Let me be a little more specific. So let me just introduce this uh, notion of chat gating. This is basically the, uh, the first technique that I've been introduced. Um, this uh, current channel gating applies to CNNs and this is the high ideas. ideas. So basically, given, uh, given an input image, we first want to do some partial layer computation. I'm going to define what exactly partial layer computation means uh, pretty soon. So once we are done with this a partial computation, we will get this so-called importance estimate for each pixel in the, this feature map. Okay. 
And after this, we uh, compare with uh, so-called uh, threshold, learnable threshold, we got a gating function. And after we go through this gate, we identify which pixels are less important or unimportant and which ones are more important. For the less important ones, we simply skip the rest of the computation. We're going to just use the, the partial result okay, as the, the output. Otherwise, if identified pixel being more important, then we execute the remaining computation. And eventually we combine these two. Okay, so that's the, the high level idea. And the very important thing that I want to note is that this is actually dynamic, right? This happens at inverse time. Uh, and the amount of compute that we may have to do is going to vary across different input images. So this is the key, key difference from the, the traditional techniques. Okay. And this is also fine grain. Okay. Uh, by doing fine grain pruning, uh, we can avoid this uh, you know, aggressive compression, which often incur uh, accidents. All right, hope it makes sense. Right? You know, uh, if you have questions, feel free to stop me right, at any time. Uh, let me just first explain what exactly do we mean by partial layer compute. Okay, so here's the you know, how you the you know, uh, regular, right? how to do the, the convolution in a regular way. So basically we use all the input channels, right? And we use all the filters, and then we produce the, the corresponding output channel. Right? Of course, in this case, we are using 100% of the, the, the input channel. Um, but what if we do not use all of them? What if we just use 50% of the input channels? And then we also just use the you know, corresponding filters to produce this so-called partial sum. We actually did some evaluation on this CPAR-10 using rest 18 We look at all the, you know, the, the layers. Uh, interestingly, we found that we just use 50% of input channels, and then we look at the partial sum, and we uh, measure the correlation between the partial sum and uh, the actual, the final sum. There's actually a very strong correlation between these two, which is encouraging, right? Which means that you know, probably we can just use this uh, partial sum, right? This uh, partial, partial layer compute uh, to approximate the final sum. And uh, we might be able to recover the, the loss, right? From the appro approximation through training. Okay, this is just a 50%, right? And basically drop half of the channels. Uh, turns out we can go even further. We can uh, just drop we can actually drop 75%, we only keep 25 of them. Um, and the uh, correlation between the partial sum and the final sum still remains very strong. And this is a very strong correlation, right? 0.7. Uh, this is in terms of the, the Pearson factor coefficient. And we can go even further, turns out. We can just use one out of uh, eight channels for the you know, this input dimension. And it turns out that correlation is still modest, right? 0.5, right? This, in this case, a 0 0.50, 0 0.56, uh, which is not bad at all, right? So this is basically what we mean by partial layer computation. So with this in mind, uh, let me uh, introduce a channel gating in a more precise way. Okay. Again, we are doing convolution, right? You know, we have a set of input channels. We're gonna divide us into two parts. The first part is called base pass. And the second part is called, uh, this is the, re the, the remainder. The base pass is the part that we always compute. So this basically produces the, the partial sum. Okay, we always execute this part unconditionally. And this is gonna uh, produce a set of a partial sum, right? You know, this, uh, this is gonna give us the importance of the individual pixels in the feature map. And then we go through a, a gate function um, for inference, this is actually a, a step, uh, this is a basic step function. If you are above the threshold, then the, the pixels are considered important. This pixel will go through this so called conditional pass or the, the remaining pass, right? The, these R means a remainder or remaining pixels. The idea here is that also the hope here is that you know, this part, right, is sparse. Basically, uh, we will just be done with the, the base pass for most of the, the pixels. And we only need to do the, the conditional pass right, to go through the remaining channels for the, the only a subset of the pixels. Right? So in the end, uh, we combine these two. So this is the, the main idea behind channel gating. Right? Of course, you, know, may ask, you may ask, right, what exactly is this gate function? Right? How do we determine the threshold? We actually have a threshold 
per uh, output channel per layer. So there are actually quite a few threshold, although you know they don't add much to the add much overhead right to the model to the whole model. But still, there are quite a few parameters, like many parameters that we have to set. There's actually no way that we can do it by just hyperparameter tuning. Right? That would be too much. So that's why we have to be able to learn this uh, threshold automatically through training. Again, you know, these are learnable, this threshold. So this is how we learn it. Uh, actually, channel gating, this is trainable. We only need to do a single pass training to learn these uh, gating policy. Uh, this diagram basically shows the, this is not the inference graph, it's basically the, the, training, uh, the training compute graph. Uh, you don't need to pay much attention to some of the details, right? Uh, you actually don't need to, uh, this BM is batch form, it's something you can actually get rid of one of them, but uh, the key thing is that all of these blocks, right, need to be differentiable when we do the, the back prop, back, backward propagation. And this gate function, uh, like I mentioned, is supposed to be a step function, which is not differentiable. Uh, the way we do it is uh, in the backward propagation, which is approximate with a soft sequence, and which turns out to work pretty well, pretty effectively. Uh, with these uh, uh, learnable threshold, um, we can you know, basically uh, learn right, you know, which paths, right? so basically which pixels are important and which ones are less important. We can do that on the fly. Okay, and also I want to quickly mention that this uh, gate function is actually pretty uh, cheap in terms of the hardware implementation. Right? In the inverse time, it's just a single comparison. That's it, right? with some constant. And also, uh, some of you may have this question, right? You know, which uh, channels, right? Which channels do we choose at the inverse time? Should we choose the, the first few channels, or you know, the last few channels, or the middle few channels, right? For the base pass, based the unconditional execution. Uh, the answer is it does not matter because all of this is learnable. All we need to do is to, to choose the, the first few channels. And then uh, this, since these are trainable method, the weights are going to be automatically adjusted. Okay, so some results. Uh, first on CFR 10, on um, uh, REST 18, if you look at uh, channel gating, right, we can just choose to do one ace. Right? Basically, we only use one channel out of uh, every eight input channels. Turns out that the, the accuracy loss is fairly marginal. We can actually even improve this, but the reduction in terms of the, the amount of a compute that we can save, right, based on flop uh, savings, that's actually pretty impressive. We can actually get all the way to five x. We can become, uh, we can go, go uh, even further. We can be even more aggressive. Only choose one out of the sixteen channels. Uh, we can get eight x reduction. Uh, with also with some uh, you know, loss of accuracy, some minimal loss of accuracy. And also I want to convince you that this is indeed input dependent. And this is dynamic, also adapted. Um, these are some of the, the samples that we collected from uh, our experiment on CPAR 10. If you look at you know, some of these pictures, this is where we are getting higher speed up right, in terms of the flop reduction. Uh, for some of the other samples like this, we are getting a slightly lower speed up. Uh, this is where the, you know, on average, we are getting 5x speed up. So this is CPAR 10. Um, also, uh, the, the same technique with right, channel gating can also work with group convolution. Uh, actually, the extension is fairly uh, straightforward. All we need to do is that for each output group, we just make the corresponding input group, the, the base path, and uh, the rest of the groups become the the conditional pass. You can also combine with a channel shuffling. So this actually allows us to enable also apply channel gating to many different kinds of networks, not just REST 18. You know, I just showed you the, right, the, the result for REST 18. We also applied it to a binarized VGG network. Um, we also got quite a, right, encouraging speed up. Uh, of course, uh, also this is a uh, the regular, the Vanilla VGG, we also applied it for, to mobile net v1. So that's where we are doing this. Uh, we also get a you know, uh, speed up between two to three to four X. Okay. Just want to convince that indeed channel gating uh, is a useful building block that can plug into different kind of DNA model, right? I'll show you some image net results. This is um, first on Alex's net. There's actually a related work published in ISCA 18 
uh, which also use a similar adaptive gating idea, but they really don't have a way to learn the, the threshold. Okay. If you look at channel gating, since we can learn the threshold, we can get a much higher accuracy and also higher savings in terms of the, the, you know, the flaws reduction. We also compare with a number of other related techniques, which also do this sort of a dynamic pruning. Okay. Some are doing in the coarser grain, some are doing in the fine grain. Um, I just want to make a note that I'm not going to delve into the details of these techniques. So make the note that in terms of the, the accuracy or right, the test error, uh, actually also in terms of the flop reduction, basically in terms of the trade-off, channel gating actually outperforms all the, the existing techniques, the, also all, all the prior arts. And also channel gating is very cheap, right? Like I mentioned, all we need to do is to introduce this uh, additional gate, which is just a single comparison. Uh, many other techniques actually introduce additional, smaller network, right? They use, uh, for example, a simple linear layer, in some cases, even a BNN, right, to do the prediction inside a larger network, which is actually much more hover, right? Uh, introduce much more complexity in terms of the hover implementation. Okay, so this is basically the algorithm, right? And also some of the, the results on the model accuracy. Um, some of you might ask, right, what about this uh, conditional pass, right? Does it make the model sparse, right? Does it make it uh, more difficult to paralyze things? Uh, this is a very good question. So indeed, you know, if you look at right, different cases, different inputs, uh, you know, the, the sparsity pattern may vary quite a bit, right, for the, the conditional pass. But one thing I want to note is we actually preserve uh, important regularity across the channel dimensions. Because with the way that channel gating is designed, you know, we for each pixel, we either completely skip right, this uh, base pass with right, this uh, set of uh, input channels, or we choose to execute all of them at once. And we do uh, preserve the structure and regularity in the channel dimension, uh, which turns out to be very important for hardware implementation. Okay, I want to show you some hardware results as well. And um, this is where we build the, uh, we use HRS to build accelerator our targeting ASIC. Uh, turns out that we can just use the, reuse much of the, you know, the prior R's that we basically use a way station and SSR array to do the, the base paths, right? Basically the dense compute. We also have a way to map the, the conditional paths, the sparse compute to the same data paths uh, without losing too much of efficiency. And this whole thing is done in HRS by two students. Uh, although there's some inefficiency in HRS, but you know, we are happy with the, the results that we got. Uh, just want to quickly show you some of the you know, performance and power results uh, compared to the baseline. This is a baseline SSR array, way stationary one without channel gating. Uh, we can get uh, 2.3x higher speed with uh, uh, near 2x reduction in power in energy, based at 1.8x higher energy efficiency, uh, with 20% of the uh, area overhead. Uh, in fact, um, Jordan showed that the, in this case we are mapping resident 18, this is 8-bit model to this uh, you know, this accelerator. Um, the theoretical speed up. Okay, this is the the baseline. Right, this is the execution time. Uh, this bar is the, the theoretical speed up. So the green one is what we managed to achieve. The theoretical one is 2.8, like I showed you before. Um, we are able to achieve 2.3. There are actually some pipeline bubbles that we might be able to squeeze if we can uh, further optimize our HR design. Um, but you can see that we can actually approach the, uh, the theoretical speed up right, in a reasonable way. Okay, so this is channel gating. Um, I also want to briefly mention, although you know we are mainly focused on inference over here, uh, there are actually uh, also a lot of sparse compute in the training part as well. Okay. So there's also opportunity to use channel gating for similar ideas to speed up training as well. Okay. All right. Okay, let me move on to the, the second one. Let me just briefly explain the, the second idea, the second uh, cut. Uh, precision gating, which is where apply a similar technique to quantization. Uh, this work is led by my student each year. Also, this is a joint work with my colleague, uh, Chris Asa and Asan. Uh, this was published at I, I Clear last year. 
this is where we uh, exploit this so-called dynamic quantization. Um, quantization is also very well known right, you know, uh, for improving the efficiency of the neural net model. We look at this uh, shuffle net v2, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.5x architecture. Um, you, know, you don't actually lose much of accuracy when you quantize it to eight bits. But if you want to build a, a low bitwidth model, right, if you go down to six bits, six bits or five bits or even lower, you're going to see this a trade-off. Right? You're going to pay this a price in terms of accuracy. The, the accuracy is going to drop right, when you lower the bits. The, one of the, the, the reason is that you know, when we look at the low bitwidth network, right, in many cases, we have to deal with so-called outlier problem. Basically, if you look at most of the neural nets, um, the distribution of the weights and activation, they typically follow a, you know, the bell curve, right? This uh, uh, distribution where most of the, the values, you know, activations, they're close to zero, um, but they are often some outliers, right? Like this. Okay, so these outliers, they are also, they are often large in values. Basically they are important right, in determining the, the final result. Okay, if he, if he, if you simply throw them away, we just do the, the clipping, you simply throw them away, uh, that's gonna hurt accuracy. But if you do not throw them away, right? If you keep them, it's gonna stretch the quantization grid quite a bit, which is gonna uh, hurt the precision as well. Right. So this is sort of the dilemma, dilemma that we have to deal with. Um, since we have to right, deal with the outlier, uh, we actually this sort of motivate us to to do a more more dynamic scheme where we do uh, do precision. So this is where uh, precision gating comes in. Okay, you can uh, quickly tell that precision gating is actually very similar to channel gating. Um, the key idea is that we also want to do this at inference time, adaptively. Okay, so this is going to vary across different input images. We instead of partitioning the the channels, okay, we are dividing the the bits. Okay, let's say we have eight bit activation over here. We divide it into the, the MSBs or most skin bits. Okay, so this is basically the, our base path, the uncontrolled path. And then we also have these low bits. Okay, we save them for the, the control path. Right? The way it works is very similar to channel gating, but we use the, you know, the high bits. Okay, there is basically dense compute to compute a partial sum. Okay, we push it through the gating function, and then we have the, the sparse part. Right? We have a bit mask. And then we go through the, the rest of the compute if you have to. The hope is that in most cases, we only need to do the, the very low bitwidth compute with this such uh, so called pre precision gating or PG. Okay. And again, this is uh, uh, input dependent. Whether we only do low precision or low bitwidth compute, or we do both. This is basically a do precision scheme. All right, hopefully this makes sense. Right. Again, we are basically using the is a partial sum to approximate the result in most cases. Okay, so here are some results. Um, actually, PG works for both CNNs and also LSTM. Actually, works for uh, different kind of uh, activation functions. I'm going to leave out those details for this talk. Uh, let me just quickly show you some results. Uh, this is a ResNet 20 on CFR 10. We compare with a scheme which does not have a, a learnable threshold. It is published in ISCA 18 also. And you see that there's a huge difference, right, in terms of accuracy, right, you know, 74, that's just uh, you know, very low. There's another paper related work at the uh, CVPR 19. Uh, they also have a dynamic scheme, um, but if you look at our result, we can get very good accuracy, but in terms of the average bitwidth that we have to use, it's much lower, because okay? we can actually get a much higher sparsity. Um, very similar results for image net. So this is where we look at shuffle net v2, we can go uh, all the way to four bits. As on average, we are using 4.7 bits and the accuracy is actually very similar to the, the one without quantization, which is this actually the eight uh, bit one. Um, pretty much similar trend for LSTM. Uh, with PG, we can get uh, a good sparsity, very low average bitwidth, and uh, the, in the perplexity, which is the score is very close to baseline. Okay, all right. So at this point, you know, you may ask, um, you know, how do we realize that, right? In hardware, how do we realize this kind of sort of a, you know, dual precision scheme? Is it achieved? 
right, is doable in real hardware. And also, can we apply this technique to the extreme case? Can we apply it on you know, one bit network or the so called uh, a BNN or binarized uh, neural network? Right? So, this is actually what I'm going to focus on in the rest of my talk. Okay, so let me introduce this uh, um, product called FRAC BNN. Uh, this is a basic BNN with PG, with precision gating. This work was published this year at PJ21. Uh, uh, it's also led by student each year. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, my group, between my group and Professor Deming Chen's group at UIXD. Um, this paper got uh, is one of the, the three best paper nominees uh, at the FPJ conference. In case you're not too familiar with BNNs, uh, this is the, you know, the, the very quick intro uh, with BNN or binary neural nets all the weights and activations are binarized into either minus one or plus one. Basically, we are using the bipolar encoding, right? Compared to the, you know, the traditional CNNs, where we use broken point or fixed point types. Uh, the benefits are obvious, right? Uh, with this extreme quantization, with just a plus one and minus one, we don't really need to use any regular, right? Or normal, right? This expensive multiplies and additions. Instead, the multiplies become just the x norm operations, and then the, the sum right becomes the, the inner product becomes x norm plus the, the population count. Population count means that we are just counting the number of ones right in the bits. There are a lot of benefits. There are actually a lot of um, you know people interested in BNNs because they're very well suited for resource limited devices uh, like embedded FPGAs. Uh, many people also uh, use uh, BNN, hope to use BNN for processing in memory because of the, the, the low compute complexity they promise. Um, but, the, but there are some trade off right, with BNN. Right? You can imagine that uh, there's this uh, accuracy and complexity trade off that we have to, to be careful with. Actually, um, when the first BNN, this is the, the newest 16 work. Okay, this is a seminal, seminal paper, and they first introduced the idea of BNN to show that this is actually trainable, which is a plus one minus one encoding. And they actually got pretty decent results on small data sets like MNIST and CPAR10. Um, but if you look at the accuracy on image chat, you know, this is just very bad, right? Uh, this is just awful, uh, just at 60, uh, 36%. And later on, you know, uh, there's a a long line of work, right? Very active body of work trying to improve the accuracy of BNN. Uh, later on, right, uh, same year, XNORNet uh, improved accuracy to 51. And then by RealNet introduced this uh, shortcut or residual connection into the BNN model. They further improved accuracy to 56. Okay. And then there's Ensemble BNN 61. And more recently, uh, uh, there's something called Real to Binary further improve the accuracy. And then there's this uh, React Net model, which, uh, um, which improved the accuracy close to near the, the rest at 18 level. Okay, if you look at this plot, right? React Net uh, improved the accuracy to 69%, which were uh, already very similar to rest at 18. Okay, this is great. But if you look at some of the, uh, the more uh, mobile friendly network, compact network like mobile nav 2 no, this one is still worse right, in terms of accuracy. With FRAC BN, this is basically our work. Uh, we actually the, the first to, uh, to propose the BNN, to introduce the BNN that can achieve mobile nav V2 level accuracy. So now we are standing at close to 72, 72%. I'm going to introduce like, how we did it. Okay, so these are the, the main things that we did. Again, this is a conventional BNN, right, with FRAC BNN. Um, we uh, did three major things. One is we actually binarized the input layer as well. Okay. In the past, people have found that the input layer is very hard to binarize without losing accuracy. Uh, but I'm going to argue that it's actually very important that all the layers are binarized. So I'm going to explain uh, why pretty soon. And also we apply PG precision gating to these uh, uh, binary convolution layers so that we can do this uh, dual precision uh, compute. We can do a one bit basically we do one bit compute most of the time and that's where we have the you know this fractional the, the notion of fractional activations and uh, we also implement the whole thing on an fpj embedded fpj and we show a real-time performance all right so let me start with the 
um, the input layer. And so this is where we actually use a, a different kind of encoding to enable the efficient and also more lossless uh, finalization. First of all, you know, you may ask, um, why do we care about the input layer? Right? In many cases, it's not the, the most compute intensive one uh, since we are only dealing with three, three channels right, coming in. Uh, but uh, the problem is that for, especially for embedded devices, right, where we have a limited amount of resources, we cannot finalize the input layer. Uh, that means that we have to have a dedicated hardware module to do the, the high precision compute, you know, either in the, the floating point format or fixed point format. And then we use the, some binarized commotion engines to do the rest of the compute for the rest of the layers. Um, this is bad because, you know, since we have, have a dedicated uh, separate a part of the, right, the, the hardware resources for the input layer, uh, that means that you know, we are actually lowering the, the resource efficiency. Right? This also means that the, the compute intensive ones, right? and the, the rest of the layers, they have less resources to play with. This also lowered overall performance. Um, turns out this is really important for embedded devices, especially for things like IPJ. Um, but traditionally, at binary neural net, uh, just use the fixed point format for the, the input, for the input layer, because uh, without that, you're going to quickly see the, the loss in accuracy. There are some attempts which try to binarize the input, uh, like this one is <clears throat> published three years ago, uh, where they basically, uh, first, the first attempt is to basically convert the fixed point format, right? It's basically fixed point encoding. Uh, let's say we use 8 bit for this number. Uh, this is the corresponding fixed point format. We just expand it into eight independent channels, okay? binary channels. You can imagine that this is not going to work very well, right? Uh, indeed, you know, the actress loss is just very large. Right? This is the, the result on CBAR10. You know, with this uh, simple or naive binarization, it's called the DBID scheme. The, the actual loss, like B point, right? More than A point. Uh, the same paper also proposed some other techniques. They further expand the number of channels. So just using eight, and then they add some uh, one, I think this is a one by one coding between these uh, initial uh, eight parallel channels, right? The, the fixed point coding, uh, and then they expand it to 256. But still, uh, turns out that the actual loss is non trivial, still, okay? Uh, close to either 3.5 point, it's a lot, a lot of a uh, Right, a lot of degradation in terms of accuracy. Okay, so basically, um, if you simply unpack a fixed point encoding, it's not going to work. Right, so this is something that we found out. Um, there's actually an uh, interesting reason behind it, right? Because if you simply unpack a fixed point encoding into independent channels, it means that you know you are going to lose this important information, right? You know, because fixed point type or you know the integer or floating point type. So we are doing this positional encoding. We have place value associated with each digit. If you simply unpack everything to independent channels, we're gonna lose this important information. And this is not something that the, the neural network training can easily recover from. Uh, indeed, it's the case, right? If you lose this information, those are pretty much gone. Okay, so this is what we did. Uh, instead of using this fixed point encoding or unpack fixed point encoding, we are proposing this sort of thermometer encoding. So this is where we uh, also have many input, uh, many independent input channels for the input layer. But instead of using this, uh, you know, the place or position encoding, uh, we just treat each channel as the same. So instead of using the, you know, the trigger encoding, we basically say that the height of the, the contiguous ones in this encoding indicate uh, the value. Okay, basically, all we need to do is to, to take the ratio between the ones and the overall height of the, basically the number of channels or the cha overall channel width. So that's how we can get the, the corresponding value. And this turns out to work pretty well okay, with this uh, uh, new encoding. Right? The, the sacrifice here, of course, you now there's some trade off. Right? We are expanding the number of channels to, to I think in this case, 255. Right? Um, we are increasing the, the amount of compute in the input layer a bit, but uh, it's still not as significant if you compare, the, compare to other layers. And uh, the nice thing is that we get to reuse the same hardware blocks and also the accuracy is very good okay, with this encoding. 
This is just showing that uh, in terms of correlation, right, you, know, you use this uh, thermometer encoding, we do a conversion with the, the binarized weight and the non-binarized weights, we have a very good uh, correlation, which means that this encoding actually preserved uh, the feature similarity, uh, which indeed helps. Okay, so this is how we binarize the, the input layers. And then uh, we look at the, the, this uh, convolution layers, right, the intermediate ones. This is where we apply uh, projection gating. But before that, we also made some uh, changes to this uh, React Net model. We are based on the React Net model. Uh, we, we made some changes to the, to the basic building block. We actually added additional batch norm and also we introduced additional bias into this uh, redo function. React Net used this uh, so called parameterized uh, redo, which uh, allows you to do the, the shifting and reshaping the redo. This turns out to be a very key technique to improve the accuracy. We further improved this one and uh, we made some tweaks so to improve accuracy. So this is the, the first of the changes. And the second one, uh, which turns out to be uh, substantial, this is a PG. Right? We basically do these uh, fractional activations. Uh, by default, uh, you know, we have this, uh, right? we always do the, basically we have the two bit activation now, but we, in most cases, we only do the one bit we only use the one bit MSB to do the binary, the binarized convolution. And in only in uh, a subset of uh, pixels, for the subset of pixels, we use the, the lower bit. This is the basic how we apply PG to BNNs. And uh, the nice thing about this is, uh, even though you know, we have two passes, right, the, the base pass and the textual pass, in both cases, we are doing pure binarized convolution. So basically, the, the remaining network, uh, the resulting network is still uh, purely binarized. And all the computes are binarized Mac and accumulate. All right, um, some results. First on CPAR 10, with, um, you know, with FRAC BNN, you can see that we can get uh, the state of the art accuracy with a fairly small model size, but depending on how, who we compare with. Uh, we are uh, pre presenting a much more favorable trade-off. In, in, on average, we are using 1.4 bits uh, with PG. That's why it's called fractional activation. That's why it's called FRAC BNN. We uh, improved the state of the art right, compared to React Net by two points. And also, if you look at another right, work, which reached similar accuracy, but they're using a much larger model, okay, a way larger model. And this is the result that I showed you a bit earlier. Right? This is the how FRAC BNN compared to other BNN works. Uh, this is reaching mobile net V2 level accuracy. And uh, in terms of the, the trade out, right, it basically dominates the, the existing work, you know, React Net and some other BNN families by a large margin. Okay. Um, let me also quickly talk about the, the hardware implementation. Like I mentioned, we are talking about this embedded FPGA. We also use HLS, uh, similar to channel gating. And we can actually uh, use a fairly dense, uh, dense, uh, this binarized convolution engine to implement both the, the uh, this base pass and also the, the, the conditional pass. Right? Uh, we basically can leverage the structure, right, or the regularity across the channel dimension for the, the fractional convolution part. We also leverage in both the unrolling and pipeline parallelism to get high throughput. Um, the nice thing is that all the layers, right, like I mentioned, share these uh, convolution engines, including the, the input layers. And uh, these are binary convolution layers. All right, so this is the, the hardware results. First on CFR10, uh, you can see that uh, we used the, the FRAP BNS is a much smaller model. We can achieve much higher parallelism on the same device. And I compare this related work to the public FPGA 17, we are 16x faster. And compared to another work, we have uh, also have better frame rate in, with this basic performance and also higher accuracy. This is basic the, the resource utilization. All right. Again, uh, you know, we are pretty happy with both the, you know, the, the trade-off, right? both higher accuracy and also higher performance. That's CFR10, and uh, this is ImageNet. 
image that obviously is more challenging to implement, right, on um, embedded FPGA. So this is where we compare with two related work. This one is also binarized. It's got thin R. Uh, if you look at the accuracy, you know, it's just, just not close, right, 50. And they can get a high frame rate, but accuracy is just too low. Uh, this is more probably a more random work. This is called Syn Synergy from Berkeley and Xilinx. It published, it's published at uh, FPGA 19. They use a four-bit network. The accuracy is actually lower than ours, eight by three point. And their frame rate is also lower than FreshDNN. This is on the same device. Again, on average, we are just using 1.4 bits right, compared to this four-bit compute. Right. Again, the, in terms of resource usage, we are using uh, you know, lots, right? Since the, the, the binary compute, you know, we do have some residu residu residual parts and also we have some uh, batch forms. We do use some DSPs, but this actually can be further optimized. All right. And um, like I said, right, this is real time. We can get close to 50 frames per second. There are actually quite a bit of optimization that we have not done yet. Uh, if we further push the if we further fine tune the HRS code, we can probably get an even higher frame rate, even higher speed up. All right, um, this is pretty much my last slide. I uh, just want to quickly summarize. In this talk, I introduced CG, right, PG, channel gating, and pushing gating. Um, we really believe that you know, these sort of adaptive fine grain optimization can be a very effective approach to prune or quantum DNS dynamically right, without losing much accuracy. Of course, you know, these require uh, efficient design, how it's done as well. We did try this, you know, we applied PG to BNN and we got the uh, frag BNN. Uh, this gave us a very good accuracy and we are able to binarize everything and get very high speed up and also very good results on embedded small device. Just want to make a note that all of this, you know, the, the code to train CG and PG, uh, these are open source and also frag BNN is open source. Uh, we released the model, we also released the HRS code. Everything is uh, reproducible. All right, so we start um, and pretty much done. Just want to give credits. Right? You know, this is uh, you know, last but not least, of course, right, to the, the students and collaborators and sponsors. Okay, we start. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Zhu. Thank you very much for your great talk. So uh, any questions from the audience? So you can unmute yourself. Uh, excuse me, professor. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, so thank you for the amazing talk. So I have a question about the, so when it comes to uh, whatever um, journal gating uh, or precision gating, um, I think, um, Please correct me if, if I'm wrong. I think you mentioned that the uh, the regularity pattern of the input of the input feature map is kind of uh, remain because we are only kind of uh, how to how to say separating the journal or we separating the um, uh, um um the single how to say the single like for example there's two bits and we separate them to the uh, to what uh, to one bit and, and 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 another bit but we didn't change the how to say the the, the pattern of the feature map, right? Uh, but if we like, if we change that, so what, what you're trying to say is that um, if we change the regularity, for example, we are only taking half of the feature map, would that cause a lot of uh, penalty in, in, in inaccuracy? Um, but I think there are two parts of the question, right? So let me try to rephrase. Basically, the first part is about the, the, the structure of the, the sparse compute, right? Because you know, we have yes. the base path and also the initial path. So one yes. thing is I want to uh, clarify is that for the sparse part, right, for this so-called conditional path, uh, yes. we do have different kind of sparsity pattern across different input images. Okay, so that's going to vary across uh, the input. Uh, but what I mentioned is that you know, although uh, we have different sparsity pattern across the spatial dimension, right, um, but we do preserve the, the structure across the channel dimension. So that I one's see. preserved. So that's how we can exploit this uh, sort of structure to get high speed up, right? So this is still kind of different from the, you know, the totally unstructured sparse pruning, right? Which may not preserve any regularity across any dimensions. I see, I see. Right. Um, 
the the second question is about I guess it's about more about granularity. Sorry, uh, if we prune it at a much coarser grain, what's going to happen? Yes. Right? Yes. Um, yeah. So this is a good question. Um, you know, we did not do too much of experiment, but you know, there are actually a lot of work right, doing different kind of a coarse grain pruning, right? Channel level, right? Filter level. So in yes. if you look at most of the Right, the re existing results, right? They are worse right, in terms of accuracy. Um, this is actually something that we plan to exploit maybe later on in the future, right? To see, you know, what exactly is the the right granularity. But in our case, um, we are basically doing fine grain, right? Because we believe that this allows us to get the highest accuracy, and also we are not actually losing too much in terms of performance, right? Because the scheme we the first the, the gating function is just a comparison. It's very cheap, right? And also we do have the, the regularity across the, the channel dimension. You know, we even do the, you can do batching, we can further sort of mitigate its sparsity. Yes, yes, it is. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, that's a very good question. Other questions from the audience? Hello, uh, hello, Dr. Zhang. I have some question about BNN. Uh, so, mm -hmm. um, uh, did you um, try to uh, analyze the mobile nine v two? Did we try to analyze the uh, no, uh, binary binary uh, binary the mobile nine v yes. two? Yes. Um. Oh. Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, I think what we did is, you know, we actually extend this, uh, we build on this uh, recent work called React Net, right? React Net is actually based on mobile net. Uh, I might be wrong, I believe it's a mobile net v1. Okay. Um, yes. So basically they, they binarize mobile net. Um, I need to double at most v1, okay? and then we build on top of it. Okay. Um, also, I forgot to mention, um, you know, the, you know, we don't have to binarize, uh, we don't have to base on mobile net. You know, we actually have some more recent result. Uh, hopefully it's gonna be published soon. We can actually achieve, uh, this, is gonna, this is a collaboration between Cornell and Google. Uh, we can achieve even higher accuracy okay, uh, with BNN, uh, actually much higher accuracy. Just wanna give you guys a preview. Hopefully you can stay tuned. Okay, uh, can you share, uh, share some experience uh, in training uh, uh, BNN, uh, especially uh, the network with the uh, that wise uh, convolution operator. Um, how to share some experience with training? Um, yeah. I guess you know this is probably a compli complicated question, right? Uh, like I mentioned, uh, we hopefully we will be able to uh, publish some additional results soon on BNN. Right? Uh, in the new paper, we will show you the. A uh, more detailed training recipe, yeah. how we binarize a uh, neural net. To actually, indeed, uh, training VN is a different ballgame compared to training other low bandwidth networks. There are many little things that we have to take care of. Okay. Um, but just want to give you guys some idea. Right? Uh, it's actually doable, it's achievable, and it seems promising that BNN will play a major role in both uh, embedded devices and maybe even in data center as well we can get high accuracy. Because indeed we can dramatically reduce the compute cost, right? In terms of those, you know, this arithmetic intensity and also energy, and also the memory blueprint. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions from the audience? If no more questions from audience, actually, I have some questions. Yeah. So, so, so thank you a lot for this amazing talk. And um, I have one question. So uh, have you ever tried to explore that to like the low precision training for the convolution network or the like the LSTM? But recently, like the, the IBM, they have a series of the papers for those the, like the two bit or the four bit training. Right. Um, 
Yeah, this is not right. This is also a super relevant question uh, since we're asking that. But this is something that we plan to look at, but we haven't done that yet. Right? No, uh, because for now we are mostly focusing on improving the right the accuracy, at least for the, the path accuracy, right? For the low bilkis network. But indeed, I think there are also a lot of potential to improve the, the training efficiency as well. Right? Uh, like I mentioned, when you look at CG channel gating and also precision gating, if you look at the paper, we actually do have some theoretical analysis on the, the sparsity of the training as well. Actually, I think it's in the, the PG, the precision gating paper. We actually show that um, we, can, uh, we are allowed to build more efficient or maybe more special hardware. A large part of the, the training can be also sparsified. And uh, we can also just do a very low bitwidth compute for the training part. Right. Um, that's part of the, the things that we are looking at, but we haven't built anything. You know, uh, we haven't done any hardware implementation or we haven't trained a low bitwidth network. Or haven't done a low bit training on commodity hardware like GPUs yet. Okay. This might be an interesting research direction. Thank you. And uh, I have another question that so, uh, so, so uh, did you ever do some experiment like to combine the PG and the CG together? Because it looks like the CG, uh, sorry, the PG it can because it can also like to reduce the, the memory footprint of the activation. Yeah. Hard. So that is quite important, especially for the training process, right? And yeah, for the yeah. PG, can it can reduce a lot of the computational cost. So I, I'm, I was wondering whether maybe so the combination of them together maybe kind of a feasible solution for the high performance training hardware. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we haven't tried that yet. No, just to the, because of lack of a uh, you know, resources and manpower and such. But this is definitely doable, <laughs> yeah. I think. Because right, we do find that some layers, right, some uh, some layers, for example, the input layer that I just mentioned right, in BNN, those are like more resistant to quantization, right? You know, there might be this interesting trade-off, right? Basically, some uh, also I think there are some prior studies that show that uh, some layers are easier to prune, right, for channel level pruning. Right? I'm not talking about you know CG, right? The basic people just try to take away channels, right, proper layers. No, for certain layers, it's actually much easier to prone. Certain layers are much more difficult to prone without losing accuracy, right? So I think there's this interesting trade-off between the, the channel level proning and also quantization. Because if you think about this uh, thermometer encoding, right? You know, it's really just uh, converting the, it's a bit of different view of doing the, the quantization, right? You know, to some extent, the quantization is really about the encoding, right? You know, there might be a way to, to somehow, uh, you know, how should I phrase it? So basically, I think there's this interesting connection between quantization and channel level pruning. If you look at the different kind of encoding, right? There, there's this uh, interesting interplay. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting observation. So to interpret the quantization from the perspective right. of the encoding. Right, right. right. So that's what we did, right, for the, the FRAP and more. But that's not necessarily the optimal way. So any other questions from the audience? So if no more questions, so let's thank our speaker again. So thank you Zhu for your very excellent talk. And uh, also thank everyone to attend our this week seminar talk. So see you guys next week. Thank you, Zhu. Right, thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, bye.